I call this public caucus to order. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss ways in which our state legislators may be able to assist the city of Scranton with its critical financial struggles as it enters its 21st year of distressed status under the myriad failures of Act 47. Further, the Council of the City of Scranton invited our guests to this caucus in response to the requests of the Scranton Lackawanna Taxpayers Association and other city residents who wish to hear from their state officials. In attendance this evening are Pennsylvania State Senator John Blake, Pennsylvania State Representative Kevin Haggerty, and Mr. Tom Welby, legislative aide to State Representative Martin Flynn. Representative Flynn is unable to participate since he is conducting hearings on privatization of state-run liquor sales. Welcome to Scranton City Council cha uh, Chambers, gentlemen, although Mr. Welby, you're certainly no stranger. <laughs> As some are aware, Senator Blake and I have met several times in the last two years to discuss the financial state of Scranton as well as potential remedies, some of which achieved our mutual agreement, such as the Senator's firm advocacy of a county sales tax, while others, like a commuter tax, met with a respectful divergence of opinion. I have since read of State Senate assistance that may be provided to strengthen nonprofits' tax exemptions through legislation and to determine methods to alleviate the burdens of financially strapped and or distressed third-class municipalities, neither of which addresses the demonstrated needs of Scranton. However, I have confidence that Senator Blake will do his best to include Scranton among the distressed third-class cities targeted for potential assistance. Further, while Scranton struggled against bankruptcy, Lackawanna County gained state approval for an increase in its hotel tax fairly quickly. Of course, I recognize that both representatives Haggerty and Flynn are freshman legislators, and as such, were not participants in the county hotel tax increase. They've enjoyed but a brief time in which to make their marks in the House of Representatives. How, although we do await those acts with great faith and hope. In addition, I commend Representative Haggerty for his reintroduction of two House bills into the House Urban Affairs Committee, which would provide for the purchase of military time toward retirement for our public safety employees. Gentlemen, we recognize that you serve and represent not only Scranton residents, but also constituents in areas outside of our city. While Scranton shares the financial hardships of many third-class municipalities statewide, there are facts and circumstances that are unique to Scranton alone and are not a burden to our neighbors and your other constituents. Like so many others, our city is comprised primarily of hard-working blue-collar families and senior citizens who struggle to survive on fixed incomes. However, nearly 25% of our population live at or below the poverty level. More than 30% of city properties are owned by nonprofits. And Scranton's unemployment rate together with those of Wilkes-Barre and Hazleton, has remained the highest in our Commonwealth for 35 consecutive months. In 2011, the State Supreme Court ruled against Act 47 and the City of Scranton in favor of Act 111 and Scranton Public Safety Unions, awarding upwards of $30 million to police and fire. This decision was the climax of a 10-year battle. Senator Blake, uh, you were formerly employed by the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, is that correct? Yes, it is, madam. And during President. what years were you employed by this department? Uh, 07 to 10. Now, 
You may recall that Mayor Doherty had stated to the press and media that the state, that is DCED, would not allow him to approve the contract that was negotiated between the city and its public safety unions in October 2008. Therefore, it appears that Scranton was used as the test case, or guinea pig, by the State Department of Community and Economic Development in its battle for supremacy between Act 47 and Act 111, particularly since a DCED attorney, Clifford Levine, presented the city of Scranton's case before the state Supreme Court. Senator Blake, were our mayor's statements accurate? Well, madam, I would tell you that I, I, I don't have what I would call first-hand knowledge of the legal assessment in order to give you what I think would be an appropriate legal response to your question. I would tell you, however, uh, that we felt that the Supreme Court ruling was wrong. I would tell you that the dissent in that ruling uh, by the Supreme Court Chief Justice Castile seemed to resonate more properly for DCED's position, and so here we are. Um, I, I would tell you this. I believe that the interpretation that for years was held by both the city, its governing body, including the mayor and council, as well as the city, of, as well as DCED, which took, took you ultimately to that court case, was well-founded, was proper, was justified, was substantiated, and it is, again, a regret that I have to sit here publicly and tell you of my, my basically, my surprise at the, end, at the end game here, at the Supreme Court ruling, and because I really believed it, uh, it undermined an argument that had stood, withstood the test of legal time up to that point. So, and, and certainly yeah. the results are going to be helpful to other municipalities, but it, it s serves Scranton well in no way. But I, I guess I was, again, looking for a response in terms of, was it just a city government decision to um, set aside that contract that was negotiated in 2011, which incidentally would have cost the city and its taxpayers less than half of what has occurred via the Supreme Court award, mm -hmm. or whether if, as the mayor says, it was through your office's um, push and drive that that contract was set aside and the uh, path to the Supreme Court was forged? Well, Madam President, I can tell you this. At the end of the day, the decisions that pre prevail upon that process are the decisions that are made by the governing body of the city. If the mayor has made a representation that the, that the state insisted upon, you know, that, that it was the state's influence that, that uh, you know, that prompted or impelled, uh, you to the, to, to the Supreme Court, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I can't make that judgment. My feeling about it is that it's the judgment of the, of the governing body of the city, the mayor and city council, to make the decisions to carry their case forward to court or not to. So I, I can't point the finger at the mayor and say he made that as a unilateral decision. I can't point the finger at DCED and say that they forced you to make a decision that un ultimately ended up being an unfortunate one. What I can tell you is that everything that was done was done based upon what I would call historical precedent was based upon the legal requirements under Act 47, if that's what was driving it, uh, and I think it was. And I believe that it was the department's obligation, DCED's obligation, to guarantee that they fulfilled implementation of the law. So I'm not going to sit here and make a judgment on, on that decision making. I'm just going to say it was the governing body decision to make. Well, I can tell you that that decision was not made in any part by Scranton City Council. In fact, City Council implored the mayor to do quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he proceeded because of DCED's insistence, according to him. And as I mentioned earlier, further evidence is the fact that DCED presented the case for the city of Scranton before the Supreme Court, not a city attorney. Um, and, and as far as, you know, a, a historical precedent, I, I don't think there ever has been any. I think we set the precedent now. Mm -hmm. We were used to set that precedent. But nevertheless, in response to these myriad mounting financial strains, 
the city did take action. Management salaries were cut, positions were eliminated, and nearly all city fees were increased. Most city pools remained closed last summer. Further, in 2012 and 2013, city property taxes increased by 27 percent, while county taxes climbed by 52 percent. Our wage tax remains so oppressively steep, it serves as a deterrent to new business and industry. At least 17 million is owed to city police and fire within two months to satisfy the Supreme Court award, and municipal pensions are underfunded by five million in 2013. The taxpayers of Scranton are pleading for help because they cannot afford further property tax increases. They can no longer pay the fair shares of others who absolve themselves from their responsibilities. And you gentlemen are like the parents to various communities. We're all your children. One of your children is critically ill and has been kept alive through life support for the last year. You have an opportunity and I believe an obligation to try to save your child. And so I ask you, Senator Blake, Representative Haggerty, and Mr. Welby, if you would pass this along, would you support a state bailout for the city of Scranton and introduce sister legislation for such in the Senate and House? That's a very broad question. I mean, I guess the, the question would be, what is a state bailout? My, my concern, obviously, is this. I make a decision as a legislator based upon the judgment I have about what's absolutely the best for the people I represent, and I will always do that. Um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania itself um, is dealing with not only the, stress, the financial stresses of this city, but as you said your, yourself, uh, Council President, many, many third-class cities uh, that are in deep distress, deep fiscal distress for many of the systematic and what I'd, I would call structural reasons that we all know what they are. We know it's an eroded tax base. We know it's an issue associated with taxes and property. Uh, there are other prevailing issues associated with the state's failure to deal with uh, a standardized reassessment um, and taking that responsibility up to the state level as opposed to leaving at the county level. Um, there are economic development things that we should be doing in terms of driving investment into our cities in order to create job growth and to deal with what you said is a very stubborn unemployment rate here in northeastern Pennsylvania. So to ask me if I would support a bailout of the city of Scranton, I think, is asking me to make a decision that has that has implications far beyond this city to every other city that's looking for the same bailout. And it may be too expensive for the Commonwealth to do in mass. Now, are there things that we can do as legislators and things that we must do to guarantee that there are changes in public policies that can deal with the structural problems that, that lead to the fiscal distress of your city? Absolutely. And that's where I will be on the wall every day as the Senator for the 22nd District. There are things with respect to tactics and property, and I can speak to this. The Senate Bill 4 that came up trying to do a constitutional amendment, if you will, to deal with the issue of the Purely Public Charities Act is a function of a state Supreme Court ruling, which has now muddied the water associated with what that means for our purely public charities. My commentary and committee on this point has been we should not have our municipalities pitted against these nonprofits, but neither do we have an appropriate set of standards to guarantee that the nonprofits themselves can be assessed in the 21st century as to their obligation to the municipalities wherein they operate, nor do we have an opportunity to empower you with something to engage thoughtfully in dialogue with these nonprofits in a manner that would hold them accountable to what they might be required to be giving you, the city of Scranton, on behalf of your, of your residents. That is a problem. And in, in, the city of, in the city of Pittsburgh, for instance, the ICA, which is the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement, has just established a task force to deal with exactly that issue with respect to tax exempt property, its implications, what, what can we do to, to foster a, what I would call a less acrimonious and less court-driven um, dialogue between our municipal governments and our nonprofits in order to come to some understanding of the burden that you have to bear vis-a-vis -vis their tax exempt status and the obligations you have to meet basic needs to your citizens. So can I do something, and I've talked to you actually in private quarters about trying to advance legislation about, about dealing with the dysfunction of Act 47. We know it's a flawed statute. You have witnessed those flaws unfortunately, to the, to the uh, detriment of the city. 
but I think there is an opportunity for us to legislate perhaps in some way that would get you past those flaws and into a better circumstance public policy wise with respect to dealing with your fiscal distress. There's so many things that we can do. You mentioned the optional county sales tax, the issue of the ICA. We're doing things on the public private charities that I believe will result in new legislation that will set up a new set of standards and that will deal with, I think, this impasse that we're dealing with in terms of lack of clarity. And I think we can deal with that tax exempt issue in a better way than we have. The issue of reassessment is a critical one as well, not one that's taxpayer friendly, mind you, because mm -hmm. this is an issue that's extraordinarily diff difficult for any, any office holder in any kind of government right now. So that's, that's an issue that we need to deal with in terms of our failure at the state level to create some opportunities for correction. I mentioned the ICA, which is something that I wouldn't mind pursuing. The issues that relate to Act 47 in particular are even being re completely reconfigured under a task force that the local government commission is empowering now. And they're bringing labor to the table in a way that they did not do years ago. Uh, so the task force that originally established at the very origin of Act 47, which was meant to be in response to the fiscal distress of our cities, um, and which led to the actual legislation that we now know as Act 47, is, is being completely revisited by a similar engagement of those stakeholders along with labor to try to rewrite that statute in a manner that can change the trajectory of your city and other cities like yours. So I, I can't answer the question that I can offer you a bailout, Madam President, because I, I don't know what that means or what it would cost and what implications it has for other cities of the state. Well, I, I don't expect that it particularly would have any implications for any other city because, as you know, we've discussed previously, Scranton is alone in its problem concerning Act 47, Act 111, and a Supreme Court case and the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. No other city had a 34 plus million dollar judgment against it. No other city took on its unions for 10 years, as was done in the city of Scranton. They stood by and watched as all of this occurred. So that there's been you know, no foul for them, no, no repercussions, and now everything is getting fixed slowly but surely. But that doesn't absolve Scranton of that debt. And what I'm looking for is assistance in paying that debt. And that has no effect on any other city because basically each of those cities have benefited from what occurred. They escaped uh, any decisions by a court system. They're not shouldered with this financial burden of payment. And uh, now they're going to benefit through, uh, let us say, better labor relations and negotiations through hopefully an improved Act 47. But that does not solve what's happened here. And what I'm looking for, I think, are um, decisions and assurances, or lack thereof, from you gentlemen in terms of how you're going to help this city. Well, this, listen, I, I will do anything that I can to advocate for state support for the city of Scranton. I do it every day. Um, so it's not a problem for me to do that. I think you are correct in the distinctive nature of the burden that the city has had as a result of the Supreme Court ruling. I, I don't dispute that point. You make a, an appropriate argument. The question, and, and, and by the way, you know, the city did try to assist you, or the state did try to assist you in the midst of the crisis that we came through. There were at least three million dollars that I can recall that were put on the table that were that was distinctive. That was, and you know, the administration came forward and did actually provide some support to the city, albeit not enough, but at least it provided some support that I think was distinctive and that was unique, and in, in that they realized the depth of the crisis. It's certainly not enough to deal with the burden that you have articulated, Madam President. I understand that, and I'm glad to go to Harrisburg to find a means by which additional dollars can be brought to bear to help the city. I'm just saying that it's very difficult in this current circumstance as a minority legislator in a minority caucus dealing with a Republican majority in the Senate, a Republican majority in the House, and a governor who's not necessarily evidenced any attention to the fiscal distress of these cities, including mine in the city mm -hmm. of Scranton, and, and to go and ask for additional taxpayer money 
to bring it back home. It's a very difficult challenge. Not one that I'm not up to, not one that I'm not willing to take on, but it is a very difficult challenge. Um, I can certainly understand what you're saying. I, in some respects, have had similar experiences. But as you say, and as I would agree, it doesn't mean that we do not try, that we, we must make every effort to try to help the child that is dying, that remains on life support. I, I think we have all, all of the, the legislators locally, and, and, and you mentioned before uh, about uh, the community, this, this entire region is served by the city of Scranton. It's not just uh, uh, the city of Scranton that benefits from, from the services from the city, and, and the legislators regionally realize that too, and I can tell you that uh, Representative Haggerty is working very hard, Senator Blake is working very hard, as is Representative Flynn, but also the other local legislators and, and, and being led by uh, Representative Mike Carroll, who is, is better known as being from the greater Pittston area, but Mike heads up the representative, or excuse me, heads up the Northeast delegation, and Mike has made it very clear to all of the legislators in the Northeast District that we will work as a team. And, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's good to see that he means that, and, he, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he agrees that what happens in the city of Scranton affects the entire region of northeastern Pennsylvania. And, and while the, the, some of the circumstances that Scranton is facing are exclusive to Scranton, uh, a lot of those same circumstances uh, manifest themselves in different ways in other communities, and a lot of those other communities are faced with those same problems. Uh, we have the city of Harrisburg, who who was faced with a judgment, uh, a, a horrible judgment, and they tried to get out of it with the way of bankruptcy, and, and it seemed to be their only way out, and the court won't allow it. And, and we see where Pittsburgh uh, and Harrisburg and so many other communities are, are faced with so many pieces of property, not unlike Scranton, that are, are tax-free in, in, the, in their city, and they're working, at, working on trying to get around that. And, and I know Senator Blake and Representative Haggerty and Representative Flynn and and all of the others are not only looking at new legislation uh, that c can affect that and, and turn that around, and, and you have talked about it here, I've, I've heard you many times talk about the different ways that perhaps it can be attacked, and, and they are looking at that, and they're looking at other states that have successfully uh, found ways to, to, so to speak, tax nonprofits when it is appropriate, they think, to tax nonprofits, that being when a commercial business is being operated through that nonprofit, or, or commercial money is being made in, in, in a commercial, so to speak, way through that nonprofit. And, and we're all looking at legislation that will address that, and looking at any legislation at all that is going to help to address not only the problems of Scranton, but the problems of so many communities that face those same challenges, although we all feel it uh, so much stronger here in Scranton. Well, yes, because I, you know, I'm obviously bringing you gentlemen here because you represent us as well as our neighbors in this geographical area. So, uh, you know, certainly we're reaching out to you because we feel it is your duty and obligation to serve and represent your constituents rather than, you know, right now I do understand the concerns of other municipalities, the woes of Harrisburg the accomplishments of Pittsburgh, but they have nothing to do with what's happening here. And in terms of, you know, the state assistance that's been given to us up to this point in time, yes, a few million dollars were given to the city, most of which were repaid or must still be repaid. Very little was given in terms of a grant, and frankly, that money well, I'm just going to say it like it is. Was dangled in front of Scranton. Here's some money if you'll do a recovery plan. Agree to that recovery plan and you can have this. Don't agree to that recovery plan, you get nothing. So I, you know, I think it's, we've got to be clear here about what's happened and, and where we're going. And I'm very happy to hear that you know, everyone is so interested in the pursuit of legislation that can be helpful to us. Um, for example, uh, I believe it might have been two years ago, perhaps more, uh, Representative Friedman put forth a bill 
known as the uh, Johnstown liquor tax, perhaps. And unfortunately, that never made it out of committee. Now, this bill, as I understand it, would have provided financial relief to Pennsylvania municipalities. Would any of you be willing to introduce or reintroduce such legislation? Well, Mrs. Evans, let me first uh, start by saying that there's not a time uh, to, to place blame on anybody in the past. Uh, we, we see that in public service all the time. Uh, I'm a freshman representative, but, it, but I'm here because it is time uh, to help Scranton get out of Act 47. Um, it has been a burden uh, to this community. Uh, but just to echo uh, what Senator Blake said, you know, J John Blake is not a person who is going to provide false hope. And he is trying, and others are trying. And we are in a situation in Harrisburg and in Washington where we, we are not in control at this very time. And uh, the money simply will not be there uh, d during, during the time where we're not in leadership position. Uh, but you're, you're talking to us today about property tax relief. And, and that's what I've been dealing with, uh, with the constituents in, in the 112th district. And their concerns are so grave. And they are our child, and they are on life support. And uh, the, you made some great suggestions uh, in terms of the tiers of how we pay our taxes. We're paying one tax bill. And people are losing their homes because uh, those, that tax bill is very, very large. Uh, it's not broken down into county taxes and city taxes and, and school, you know, school taxes. Uh, we have to demonstrate the ability, before we do have s serious help from the state, to do some smaller things at home. And I think that is one of them. And this is, I believe, your suggestion. Um, yes, it was. And I know that it did not uh, come to fruition. But in the meantime, council took measures to um, address that ill as best it could. Specifically, um, we repealed previous legislation that enabled uh, the city to take the homes of our taxpayers by sheriff sale. Uh, we have hired a new delinquent tax collector who is far more accountable, transparent, and responsible. And the people of the city are no longer in fear of losing their homes to sheriff sales thanks to the act of this council. So we are, you know, we are frequently at work doing our part, what we can on our level to help our people. But we're asking for, because I'm sure everyone is aware, there are, our hands are tied in so many instances because of state law. Either what it fails to provide or what it does provide that is not, or, or, or what it is requiring of us that's not advantageous. So we seek your help, whether it be through um, a specific bailout, whether it be through a reintroduction of um, a Johnstown liquor tax, um, whether it be through uh, legislation regarding nonprofits that would enable taxation of portions of nonprofits that don't meet their stated missions and don't meet the requirements and criteria set by the law and the Supreme Court. Uh, there, are, there are many instances of payroll tax, for example, for the city of Scranton. There are many instances where we cannot move ahead without your intervention on our behalf. And I do understand that. You know, it's, it's unwise to provide false hope. I do understand that you are fighting against a Republican administration. However, as I stated earlier, we still have the obligation as elected officials to try and to do whatever we can within our realm of ability and possibility to help the child that is suffering the most of all the children you represent. I, I want to, and again, I'll echo some of Kevin's remarks and, and, uh, and even uh, uh, Tom's on behalf of uh, Representative Marty Flynn. We are, as a delegation, trying to work together. We are certainly, I mean, if I come up with ideas on my side of the, of the, of the building and I need a companion uh, on the House, we're going to have that kind of 
two-pronged mm -hmm. thrust on behalf of the city, we will do so. Excellent. There, there are some things going on that I think are important. Uh, we, we, there, there, are, there are really a couple of things to say. First of all, the most important thing we do is deal with the state budget. And within the confines of our debates on that budget, there are decisions that have vast implications, not only for the fiscal health of our city, but for the fiscal health of our school districts and for the safety net that protects our most vulnerable citizens. And in those decisions, I want you to know that every day that I go to the floor and I have to make a vote or every committee I have to go to or every meeting or every person with whom I meet in Harrisburg, I am con contemplating the impacts of that process on this city and its residents. Um, overlaying on your own tax base is the Scranton School District. Uh, if we don't fund public education properly, the Scranton School District doesn't have much choice but to go to the same taxpayers you answer to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm always cognizant of that. Um, I just met with a whole set of nonprofit providers here uh, who are concerned about their ability to continue to meet behavioral health obligations and other issues associated with uh, the quality of life and the dignity that our people realize in this city and throughout this region. So I'm constantly cognizant of that. There are specific pieces of legislation, and to your point on the nonprofit issue, I, I, I truly believe, and I say this to all of council and to everyone who's listening, that if we get through this process associated with, with what I would call recapturing the authority of the General Assembly as the entity that must promulgate what in fact constitutes a purely public charity, if that process comes to fruition, if you will, at some point we must rewrite legislation on that because it will have been a constitutional amendment that occurred after a law. And in my, the statutory authority of that law, in my opinion, would be compromised by the subsequent constitutional amendment. And I think at that point we must revisit to your point, this relationship between the purely public charities and our municipal governments. So yes, we will deal with that. It doesn't seem to happen quick enough, Madam President, but I'm telling you that that's what's going to happen down the road. The other issues are specific about trying to move state money into your city and job growth, economic development, community development, infrastructure development are all things that improve the quality of life in this community and that have the potential over the long term to generate additional revenues from your tax base and hopefully build a business community. So Lloyd Smucker has put up a bill. He refers to it at the City Revitalization and Improvement Zone, and I'm working with his office to see if I can get the City of Scranton included in this when he introduces the bill. And I want you to hear the language of its intentions. It's not unlike the one that was established in Allentown, which was the Neighborhood Investment Zone, which allowed the City of Allentown to essentially take the state and local tax funds created in that city directly back into the city, giving a, an opportunity. This would be a little bit different and perhaps more progressive than a KOZ or a KIZ where, where they're coming to you and saying, would you defer taxes? Mm -hmm. In this case, it's taking a look at the taxes that are generated in a particular geography and collecting them at the state level and then redirecting them back for the revitalization and the assistance in that city. Um, so that's an example that could, if I can get the city of Scranton included in it and, and work with my Republican colleague, I might be able to get something legislated that could have meaningful impact uh, in, a short, in a short term. So we're working on that. Uh, we did land banks uh, legislation last year, which I think is going to have uh, the ability to assist you in dealing with what I would call unproductive property, uh, whether it be blighted property, tangled uh, title, uh, where you can't get access to property, where, where you have a, another alternative at your disposal in order to get access to that, to that property and deal with um, bulk quiet title. Uh, access uh, and opportunities for you to take under what I, I would say underutilized, underperforming, and even blighted property and, and create a more productive use out of it. So that's, again, it's, it's just legislation we just got through last year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only now being rolled out, uh, but I think it could be of some consequence not only for the city but for the county and perhaps the entire region. Uh, there's an historic tax credit uh, piece of legislation we got through that focuses uh, state tax credit. We never had one before. It was always federal. Now we have an historic tax credit at the state level, which again, it was Lloyd Smucker's legislation that came through. I will continue to work with uh, the governing body of this city uh, on legislation that deals with what we spoke about in our meetings, uh, the possible establishment of an ICA uh, and to foreclose upon the issue of 47. I think that might have some value. Um, you mentioned the payroll preparation tax. They did that in Pittsburgh. Um, it is something that I continue to research. I have a little bit of angst about it that I think I shared with you because mm -hmm. the manufacturers are currently exempt from the gross receipts tax right now. And the moment you put a payroll preparation tax, even if you took the gross receipts off of them, or the mercantile tax, you know, it would have a different effect in terms of a tax shift, if you will. 
So I continue to research this and continue to look at it to see if there are means where I can untie your hands or create some additional tools that can help you deal with the challenges you have. Number one, to provide a basic level of services to your people in public safety and in public works. And number two, not to burden them with additional taxation. And that's my job every day. Um, the last thing I think I want to say to you is about public safety. I had the Fraternal Order of Police come to me uh, last week, um, not last week, two weeks ago before Holy Week, uh, to discuss uh, the potential of consolidation of a pension. Um, when the governor first suggested he was going to do some pension reform, I actually started to get excited because I thought, well, maybe we'll look at municipal pensions. We have so many fragmented. They're not very large. They're not very efficient. And they add costs and long-term costs uh, to cities like, like Scranton. <clears throat> but he wasn't interested in talking about municipal pensions. He was only interested in talking about SIRS and PSIRS and doing some things mm -hmm. at that level. So um, I plan on taking up a, a deeper look on the municipal pension issue as the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, and if I can find a way forward to create some efficiencies and that would create some opportunity to take the long-term burden off of the city of Scranton and, and like cities that are dealing with this challenge on the pension issue, uh, I, will, I will work very hard on that front as well. Thank you. Um, Representative Haggerty and, and uh, Mr. Welby, are there any bills that you are drafting or may draft or uh, may consider co-sponsoring that would directly help the city of Scranton. Now, I think the senator and I have done most of the talking. We've, we've Well, you guys, you guys are the smartest, so uh, we'll let you go. <laughs> we've discussed a payroll tax and uh, other ways in which the county sales tax, uh, other ways in which the senator is trying to work with his Republican colleagues to benefit the city. But is there anything specific that either of you may have in mind uh, that you can do in your position within the House of Representatives to assist us? Well, one of the uh, old House bills, 1776, is always being discussed. And uh, in, my, <clears throat> in my journey around Scranton, uh, it's, it's brought up to me about the 1% uh, sales tax increase uh, to eliminate property taxes. And it, it's something that has to be considered now. And when I say it has to be considered, it's because of the overwhelming majority of people who've talked to me about it. You know, this is not for me to say my personal opinion. I'm mm -hmm. a representative of theirs. And, uh, you know, it's time to explore this. It's time to explore how we, how we pay for our education in, in Pennsylvania in a fair, equal distribution of education, which we do not have, and, and to eliminate and to alleviate uh, property taxes uh, for our people. I, you know, I got this letter today, and I was asked to read it, and if you don't mind, I will, from a, sure. a resident. And uh, she's, I, I, you know, a lot of the people in and Scranton had this perception that it's all of our senior citizens who are having the hard times paying taxes and losing their homes. And this is, this is a young woman in her 30s. Uh, and she said, since having children a few years ago, I have been considering leaving Scranton and moving to the Abington Heights School District. Between the property tax, the 3% city tax for my wages, and paying for my kids to go to private school, I have become tapped out. I was born in Scranton, and I love Scranton, but I don't know if I continue to live here. But I don't know what other options I have at this point, especially if the property taxes go up again. And you know, this is this is the general synopsis of uh, the, the residents of Scranton. And we, we have to come up with a conclusion here. We have to come up with um, bipartisan support. I think it might um, be beneficial to to bring some of our Republican colleagues to Scranton. Uh, the word distress is a word to come and to listen, to see your faces, to hear the anguish, to bring testimony here to allow the governor of Pennsylvania to know that he's the governor of a city that has the highest unemployment in Pennsylvania. That's his responsibility to do something about it. Um, there, there are times and moments when you need to put pressure on the leaders, and I think right now is the perfect time to put pressure on our governor, yes. uh, where he may listen a little more than he usually does. Yes, uh, so, understood. And, and again, I won't sit here and pretend uh, to have the, the expertise and knowledge uh, as Senator Blake does. I, I am in office about three months now. Uh, I'm, I'm learning. I'm listening, uh, Ms. Evans. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight as hard as I possibly can. Uh, when, when our taxes come, we're concerned. My wife and I, and we both have good jobs, but we still live paycheck to paycheck, and, and we worry. Uh, and I think it's important to have legislators like, like John Blake, whose sole job is this job, not senators and representatives who have 
other jobs and other pensions. And when there's a tax increase, they don't even blink an eye. It doesn't matter to them. Um, mm -hmm. We have legislators here today that their sole lives are to you know public service of this area, and we know what it means when a, when a tax increase comes. So. You know, I want to say one thing before I turn it over to, to Marty's able representative here. Um, Benjamin Franklin wanted a unicameral legislature, but he didn't get one. Um, anything that can possibly get done on behalf of the city requires undi undivided cooperation with my House colleagues. I, I have to have comparable legislation achieved in the House that, that matches up with what I might pursue in the Senate um, and, and, and the energies of my House members in engaging their Republican colleagues on what are, what are hopefully bipartisan, bicameral efforts that could assist this city. That is essential in the dynamic. Um, because if I get something through the Senate, that doesn't do it. Yes. It's got to get through the House. And so that's, that's one of the critical, important things to, to be reminded of. I, I have a constant dialogue whenever there's an opportunity for that, for that, um, that common purpose uh, to, to be put up legislatively. And sometimes it's a House bill that gets back to the Senate. Sometimes it's a Senate bill that gets back to the House. One way or the other, we need that common effort. So all of us represent the same constituency, and we have an obligation to work together. And we do. The, um, uh, the, uh, we all are interested in, in uh, the sales tax bill. I mean, that's something that, that we're all looking at, and, and adding that 1% that may not be the total answer, but it certainly is a big help. And, and, and it will increase the tax over uh, many more products and services than, than it is right now, and that's going to be a burden on some people. But it's, uh, I, I think we all agree, or many of us agree, that we have to take the burden off of the property owners. The property owners can no longer shoulder that incredible responsibility that's been thrown on them uh, for various reasons, like the judgments that have come down against the city and the increases in the, the, the taxes from our school district uh, and, the, and the county taxes. It's, it's just too much as property owners. We just can't do it anymore. And so many of the property owners here in Scranton are senior citizens on fixed in or people on fixed incomes. Uh, and, and they just can't do it anymore. And, and so we're hoping for that, but it's not just that. We all are looking, as I said before, for ways to find new revenue, whether it be through uh, increased payments from nonprofits or finding ways to legally uh, and appropriately tax nonprofit services that uh, are a commercial venture at their property. Uh, and, and, and there's little things that we're doing, too, that Senator Blake and Representative Flynn and Representative Haggerty are doing for our city as well. One of the first things that, that we started working on back in December before Marty was sworn in was trying to find a way to find funds to open the pools in the city of Scranton. Now, granted, that's a lot of pools and it's a lot of money, and we know that. But we've been, been looking since uh, three weeks before he was sworn in into trying to find ways to find that funding. And, and some of the conversations we have had are with private businesses for them to also make uh, private donations from corporations and businesses as well. But we, we all, we're, we're, we're in such a con confined space as far as the, the ability to go to for revenue uh, that we're, we're, we're not thinking out of the box. We're, we're, thinking, we're thinking out of the factory. We're, we're out there looking for things. And we need from you, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that you all have been, been checking out some different things and perhaps some different ideas that different communities and different states have been doing. And, and if you could share that with us. We, uh, I, I, I know that I speak for, for Mr. Haggerty and, and Mr. Joy, excuse me, Mr. Blake when I say that we are open 24-7 if you want to sit down and talk about different ideas that you have that, that you have read about or heard about uh, from, from other communities or other states. We want to hear it and we want to get it done, uh, believe me, as much as you do. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, at, at least what I have heard from uh, many residents and, and I've uh, spoken to tonight and I'll reiterate once more, you know, we're looking for state legislation on a payroll tax, state legislation on um, proper taxation of nonprofits, state legislation on property reassessment, uh, state legislation similar to the Johnstown liquor tax. You know, we, we need specifics. Governor, we understand what you're saying. Governor has other plans for that, I would, I would add. But 
Pardon? I said the governor has other plans for that, as you might, as you might have read. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, I, I empathize. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than probably anyone here, I know what that's like mm -hmm. because I lived that for eight to nine years. But I also know that when there is a true crisis, leaders are, well, true leaders have the ability to set aside political differences, philosophical differences, personal differences, to solve problems that will save the people it serves, that will save the cities it serves. And, um, you know, I've seen it happen here. I wish it would happen in Washington. And I still hold out hope, particularly at this time, as you so um, insightfully <laughs> mentioned to us. It's a very good time, I think, to be working with the governor and the, your Republican colleagues, some of them, um, to gather support for your legislation in order to help this city. And I do like the idea that was proposed by uh, Representative Haggerty that your Republican colleagues should come here. Mm -hmm. They should see and hear what occurs in this city and not simply through the voices of city council, but through the voices of the people you represent, the old, the young, the middle class, the families who are struggling, eking out a living, working two and three jobs, mothers working two and three jobs, fathers, so that there's very little supervision for children at home. And we know the costs of daycare. And we know what, um, what the governor has done to public education in our commonwealth. You know, that, that's something particularly with which I'm familiar and that uh, is, is a personal cause where I'm concerned. So I do understand what you're trying to do there to help public education and that is imperative, I agree. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to remember that this city is unique and as each of you, particularly um, Mr. Welby and Representative Haggerty have said, the people can't afford these constant tax increases. And they're coming not only from the city, but the county and the school district, although I'll give the school district credit, it had no increase this year, but they regularly do increase taxes. Mm -hmm. um, the, city, the city has to have some help. You know, we, we can't have the nonprofits turning away, the state of Pennsylvania turning away, um, our neighbors turning away. Everyone has shut the doors on us and in fact said to all of these people and the people watching at home tonight that you're on your own. It's your burden. You pay for it. You pay for it by yourselves and frankly, we don't care how you do it, just do it. And then there are even those, none of you, none of us, who will say they can probably afford it. You know, I bet they complain, but they'll come up with the money. I've heard that said to me, but I know better because I've been here 10 years. And throughout those 10 years, I've been to so many homes, so many neighborhood meetings, met with so many legislators. I know what they're going through. I was raised that way. I began my marriage that way. I'm going back into that period of life now that's very similar to others. I was fortunate, very fortunate for a period of time. I'm no longer in that category, but I'm very cognizant that most of the people in this city have a far more difficult time than I. Yeah. Madam President, just a a few comments because I actually have to teach a class at the university tonight, so I'm watching the clock. 
I, uh, you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, I know that myself and my colleagues are deeply uh, mindful of everything that you've said here tonight and all the, and the appeals that you make on behalf of the people of this city. We are deeply mindful of it. I'm mindful of it every day that, I, that I'm on this job. Um, there are going to be opportunities for us to show some courage, I believe, legislatively. I mean, you have to fight the battle and you have to put it in writing and you have to introduce it and you have to advocate for it. Yes. And I would tell you um, that perhaps because other cities, other third class cities are struggling with the same, again, I, 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 I agree with the distinction that you draw with respect to the Supreme Court ruling because that is unique. Uh, but the other issues associated with fiscal distress that have been prevailing upon our smaller cities across this Commonwealth are pervasive and they are feeling the same crunch that you're feeling in trying to meet basic needs and services to their people. There, and it's a bipartisan issue. There are Republican mm -hmm. legislators in the Senate that are going back to their district that are meeting mayors and councils that are struggling with the similar challenges you are. Maybe with that dialogue, we can in fact produce public policy that gets to the, the governor's desk for signature that will free up the shackles that you're under, create some opportunity for investment that would change the trajectory of the fiscal performance of the city and take the burden off the taxpayers. That's what we're working on every day. Um, and I promise you that we'll continue to do so and that my door will always be open and that my coordination with the House members uh, will be thoughtful and perpetual. And uh, we hope we can give you some evidence of that courage and, and, and that commitment uh, as we continue to serve the people of Thank Lackawanna you. County and the city. Very quickly, mm -hmm. if any of my colleagues, Councilman Rogan, Loscombe, and Joyce would I have just, any I'll comments. be very brief. I just have a few brief questions. Um, and first, I'd like to um, just mention, uh, Councilman McGough called me before the meeting. To, he wanted to apologize that he couldn't make it today. He really did want to be here. Um, I just have a couple questions for Senator Blake and a couple quick comments. Um, the first one, could you explain, and, and we disagree on this issue, the 1% the sales tax specifically only for Lackawanna County instead of a statewide sales tax to reduce property taxes? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not adverse to considering an issue on a statewide basis, but I, I would tell you that if, if, if you're talking about the Independence Act, which which uh, Kevin Haggerty, Representative Haggerty mentioned earlier about just eliminating property taxes and just doing either a sales tax or an income tax uh, to fund public education. Um, again, I, I've looked at it and the concern that I have is that the moment you begin to rely upon sales taxes or income taxes as a means to fund public education, when economies suffer or go into recession, you don't generate that sales, right now we're not generating sales tax revenue because our economy is in a malaise. Uh, I get concerned about the predictability of that as a source to guarantee we can meet the $30 billion cost of public education costs. But let me step back a moment to get more to the heart of your question. The City of Philadelphia right now already has uh, an increase in sales tax. The, the County of Allegheny already has a sales tax. There is no other county among the other 65 counties of this Commonwealth that enjoys the same option. The counties that are in the Marcellus Shale region right now are benefiting from the impact fee. They'd have no interest in a sales tax. They have sufficient dollars coming to meet their obligations, I believe. But it's places like Lackawanna County and Luzerne County and Monroe County and these other counties that don't have those kinds of additional, what I would call supplemental revenues, that I think should be given the option of relieving the property tax burden by diverting it to a larger tax base in the form of an optional county sales tax. Um, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that the complete transition from property tax to sales tax or income tax can guarantee our ability to meet the tab for public education on a statewide basis. Because my concern and the concern that residents and business owners brought up to me with having a specifically only Lackawanna County wide is it's a 15 minute ride to Wyoming County, it's a 15, 20 minute ride to Luzerne County. Mm -hmm. And I know there is, there is a provision that if somebody, you know, for instance, a big ticket purchase such mm -hmm. as a vehicle. You're talking about uniformity across so that you don't have that differential yes. between county borders. Yeah, my, my fear yeah. would be that it would implementing a 1% sales tax specifically in Lackawanna County mm -hmm. would hurt businesses in the county. And because businesses are hurting jobs would leave the county. By um, implementing it statewide, you'd have to, you know, travel quite a ways to, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to avoid that, that, extra, that extra tax. And I understand that Philadelphia and um, Allegheny County, they have these types of taxes, but we saw when the previous council instituted a smoking ban that Scranton is a, is a whole other um, 
ball of wax than a big city like Philadelphia mm -hmm. when the smoking ban was put into place specifically in the city, bar and tavern owners in the city were run out of business because people who liked to smoke when they drank would go to <coughs> Dunmore, Taylor, Old Forge, just 25 minutes away. <coughs> so we're in a little bit of a different situation than a very large city like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do appreciate all, all three of you coming here, and I know I, I brought this issue up to all three of you at one point of a time or another. Um, I firmly support um, the elimination of property taxes to fund education. The residents in the city have, many of them have brought that to me, to my colleagues, and I'm sure to you as well, mm -hmm. um, especially senior citizens. Many who will say, you know, I've paid for property, I've paid property taxes all these years, my children have been out of the school district for 50 years, or maybe they sent their children to private school, and they can't afford to keep their homes. I've talked to people who have lived in a house their entire life that they grew up in, and then they, they inherit it from their parents, continue to live there in many of our neighborhoods in Scranton, and when they get that tax bill, they can't afford to pay it. So they're facing the option of selling the home and leaving the area, which if you drive anywhere through the city, you'll see there are numerous houses for sale in this city. Mm -hmm. And when these folks leave, that further reduces our tax base and leaving the rest of us here to pay more. So, and, you know, I'm sure, I think it was mentioned by Representative Haggerty that the school district portion of the taxes for the Scrantonian is the highest portion. Mm -hmm. Even though many times people think it's the city, it is actually the school district. And if we could have help on the state with aid from the state on reducing that tax on the taxpayers, if the city tax were to go up or the county tax were to go up on property, it wouldn't hurt them as much because most of the purchases that the lower income family and senior citizens are making are tax exempt, mm -hmm. such as food, um, medicine, things of that nature. They're not paying sales tax on it already. Mm -hmm. And you know that person is gonna be paying a very small amount of tax when the person like myself who does have three good jobs, expendable income, I'll be paying more, and as I should, you know, on, on, on things that are, are more of a, not a necessity, more of a want than a need. Right. I think, and I'll just make a very couple brief comments. I, I don't disagree with, with your assessment of the burden that this imposes, um, and particularly on fixed income seniors and, and younger families trying to get started. Um, the, the, the ideologically, I mean, the issue of, of, the, of the optional county sales tax is exactly an attempt at trying to reduce that burden. Um, you make a good point about creating, uh, you know, hopefully not having this uneven issue that could be a uh, competitive, economically competitive situation. Uh, so I'm certainly willing to, to take a closer look at that. Um, but, but you also make a compelling argument that we might have, we might want to think about a larger diversification of the tax base to fund, you know, to fund not only school districts but municipal services as well. So, I mean, I think we're in the same space. It's how do you implement it and how do you guarantee that it doesn't, have what I would call a, 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 a disproportional consequence of one slice of the, of the local economy or another. But the key at the end of the day is that the reliance on property taxes, the sole reliance on property taxes that you as council and the mayor have to rely on to meet, to meet your burden uh, of providing basic uh, services to your residents and that the school district must rely on is, is archaic. It's obsolete. And, and we really need to think, I think, 21st century on this point. We certainly agree on that point. And, and another thing that somebody brought up to me is actually a, a landlord in the city. You know, he said, when, when my taxes go up, I'm not eating it. It's the tenants. So it's renters as well that are paying more in their rent when property taxes go up. So it doesn't just affect the property owner, renters as well. If anyone who rents from a person or a business other than a nonprofit feels the pinch when taxes go up, and um, one final point, I, I think it's great that the three of you came here. This is very productive. I think it's something that hopefully we could do in the future. And I hope that um, you would be agreeable to either monthly or at the very least quarterly meetings um, between council, hopefully the mayor would be in attendance, and our, our three, two representatives and our senator. And if they, if they were quarterly, I would propose that once each quarter, once would be in the city, once would be in your office, Senator Blake, once in Representative Flynn's and once in Representative Hag Haggerty's, where we could go around and, and continue this dialogue um, to get ideas together um, from the residents and, and meet as a group 
to try to move forward with um, some ideas that could that could help the people in Scranton and, and other your districts. So thank Certainly. you for coming, and, and I hope you could take us up on that offer. Thanks, Is there anything else? Uh, First of all, I, I just want to thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming here. And as Senator Blake said, they, you do have an open-door policy. I'm witness to that. I met with the Senator Blake many times. Um, Mr. Welby here, I still have to get up to see Mr. Haggerty, but uh, I will be stopping in uh, with issues and, and stuff like that. But uh, that is true. You, you've always been there, and uh, hopefully this will continue, and our dialogue will continue and be progressive. And I believe Mrs. Evans spoke so eloquently on, on all of our concerns, and uh, I won't belabor any of the points. Thank you very much. Councilman Joyce? Yes, I have a few comments and questions. I saw an interesting sign today that stated, create solutions, not problems. And I think that, you know, from being in government the time that I have, uh, one of the, the main problems that I see is that things move very slow. And, and sometimes there's a struggle to get things passed through. And I think a lot of that is um, just because of politics and, and the nature of how things are. But one thing that, um, in my conversations with other uh, finance chairs throughout the Commonwealth, I spoke to uh, William Peduto about the payroll expense tax that Pittsburgh has. And that's something I see could be a great benefit for Scranton if the business privilege and mercantile tax are eliminated and business are, businesses are paying a payroll expense tax instead. But one thing that I would like to see happen is that nonprofits are added to the payroll expense tax. And that's something that Mr. Peduto and I discussed. And in Pittsburgh, he said that would have solved many of their problems. Now, I, I want to know, would you be in support of a payroll expense tax that included nonprofits paying on payroll expenses, obviously? You, you know, I, I'm not sure constitutionally how that, how that works. I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to come to a better understanding of it. What I understood would happen in Pittsburgh is is that the nonprofits, again, they're dealing on a different scale than we're dealing with here in the city of Scranton, but my understanding is the nonprofits did uh, come up with significant pilots at the same time that the city was transitioning off of its gross receipts and mercantile taxes and onto the payroll preparation tax. So it was the combination, I think, that made that work. I only answer your question this way, Councilman, because I believe that the fact that they did not include them in the nonprofits had to do with their legal authority to do so and the constitutional means by which it could be implemented or levied. Um, my, my feeling is that we need to deal with, again, I, I've been long in discussion with the council president on this issue of the payroll preparation tax, and I continue to research it, and I continue to struggle a little bit in getting the kind of data I need to understand what the implications would be for the city, uh, because I do think that there is some merit in it, significant merit in it, it, particularly for a small business. You know, you take the gross receipts and the mercantile tax off of those small businesses are only paying on the basis of payroll, smaller payroll, smaller tax burden. So it, it might become a more even Dis distribution of tax burden, I, I believe that that's probably the appropriate way to go. Uh, but whether or not the nonprofits could be captured by that, I think, is a constitutional issue. And what I would more likely rather see is that we redefine the relationship between the nonprofits and local government vis-a-vis -vis additional legislation that relates to pilots and silots and other things that I think could change the dynamic, which is so acrimonious now, and that can only be resolved in court. Um, my feeling is that we should rewrite the rules on that in order for that relationship between the nonprofits that are powerful economic drivers in our communities, the Eds and the Meds, uh, as well as the churches who are so important to the fabric of our community and the other nonprofits. Um, you know, I think that we need to deal with that relationship with municipal government while we're considering changes in tax policy. I'm not sure I can capture it all in one blow. Okay. Another thing I wanted to bring up is I am in support of a. Um, a sales tax to offset property taxes. I think that we need to help the homeowners, especially in the city of Scranton right now. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to say, though, is um, the sales tax 
that's currently being proposed, how likely do you see it as something that would go through? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll respond in, in this way. Um, I only had one Republican co-sponsor when I did it last year. I think I've just reintroduced it within the past month or so. Um, actually, I got an email from Nancy on that, so I'm not sure exactly when that happened. But um, I'm not sure if I have any additional Republican co-sponsors that, that have come on board with my idea. Uh, however, my idea is just one idea. Uh, what Councilman Rogan mentioned about a broader uh, sales tax uh, might be something that's being considered. I know that another Republican senator has put forth something that might resemble what I've put forth, but I believe has to do with, again, a county option. Uh, where all the dollars go to t property tax relief, that there'd be no other discretion. It'd be a true tax shift, uh, which is slightly different from, from the plan that I put forth. Um, so uh, my feeling is that there's, a, there's kind of like a, a growing momentum around this idea to try to change that tax structure and to try to change that sole burden on, on property taxes. I, I sense a change in the General Assembly on both sides. I, I'd let my House members speak to what, what might be happening there. The only other thing that I would throw in in answer to your question, Councilman, is that when I originally wanted this, because I believed it was the appropriate thing to do to focus on the municipal government and the municipal shift and the municipal relief, the school districts, you know, they come in saying, well, if you're going to do a sales tax and you're going to apportion it in a way that helps municipal government, we would like you to do a sales tax and apportion it to reduce, right, mm -hmm. school taxes. So then there gets to be a little bit of a tug of war between these and, and the county and the school district and the municipal are all taxing authorities that are looking for ways to deal with that shift. So I think that's the challenge to get momentum right. behind a plan that could have the broadest consensus and the best possible benefit in shifting that burden. And I think that's what we need to work out in Harrisburg. I agree. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Well, you know, as, as has been stated already, absent your <coughs> aggressive efforts and assistance, our city will die and the clock is ticking. We need action and we need your help now. And so we respectfully request that you consider all that has been discussed here this evening and that you would draft, sponsor, and or pursue legislation to fight for the good people of this city and to, sur and to fight for this city's survival. And on behalf of Scranton City Council, I'd like to thank all of you for your participation this evening. And if there are no further comments or questions. Mrs. Evans, I would just like to um, take a moment to talk of, about a, a resident of Scranton who passed away last night. Uh, Mr. Ray Nearhood, uh, who is a political activist. And uh, Mr. Nearhood became personally attached to, to myself because he was my Republican opponent in my House race. And he was in a car accident eight months ago, and he, he passed away last night. And I've, I only met uh, Ray twice, and he has some friends here today. And our conversations were long, and he was intelligent, and I learned from him, and I liked him. And that's what we need to do in public service. We need to learn from our counterparts, our colleagues, people who are on the other side. Uh, so I think we should learn from his life and take a moment to tell his wife and children that they're in our thoughts and prayers. Indeed. Thank you very much. And if there's nothing further, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. This public caucus is adjourned.